story. It's like literally like three minutes long. Yeah. It'll be like a, a short, short little preview. So it is called the, you know, the Beast You Are is the name of the novella. That's, that's in the back. That's like the big original piece. Mm -hmm. um, it's like one third of the book, word count wise, but probably almost like a half, um, by like page wise, because uh, I wrote the original. I wrote the novella free verse. The freest of all possible verse, like it's basically just sentences that look pretty by the design. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I tried to put a few more other, you know, there, there's 15 stories, they're not all monster stories, but there are some, um, there are some in here, and here's like a really short one that I wrote, let's see, just gotta flip to the page. Um, a couple of falls ago, I was approached by a woman who runs a, uh, charity that raises funds to help cure cancer in England um, and their their thing was we're gonna have all these writers you're given only like three hours on it one Saturday afternoon and you have to write a story during those three hours and then they eventually for the charity put put out that anthology as an ebook kind of thing now the rules were you had to write for those I think it was maybe it was four hours you could go back and edit it afterwards so I don't know how many people added to theirs but this is what I wrote, so it's really short. I only had four hours. <laughs> Wasn't gonna write like a huge long uh, tone poem. But it's, uh, this one's called Mostly Size. It was the same old story. No one knew where it came from, and they were not prepared. The giant monster, impossible in its bipedal form, stomped and smashed the city, working in a pattern known only to itself. No, com uh, no computers or pundits were left unsmashed to pause it otherwise. Aside from its rumbling and shuffling footsteps, hammering hands and gnashing teeth, the only sounds the dwindling denizens heard from the giant monster were whooshing intakes of breath and hours later the calamitous exhales. It breathed as often as the encroaching and rising tides changed. The giant monster never once cried or called out. No mighty roars echoed across and beyond the city. Toward the end of the attack, which is to say the end of the city, dust and debris cumulonimbus, like that. Very nice. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, around the giant, I was just surprised I said it correctly. Um, around the giant monster's head and upper torso. When it breathed, the cloud briefly cleared, exposing the indifferent sun. One cyclonic exhale stripped away the ruin of Max's house and the bed under which he'd been hiding. It must have been almost noon because the sun was directly over the monster and there were no shadows. Were there a monster shadow of any length, Max would have been standing in it. As it was, he stood on shaky ten-year-old legs, his head tilted upward to the unending heights of things. After untold and continuing hours of horror and sorrow, while surely facing annihilation, Max experienced a strange feeling akin to he couldn't explain, couldn't summon a comparison. There was more fear, of course, but a different kind, one that made him want to see it all, to see everything, even the end. Perhaps it was all the terror, loss, and despair in concert with the concussions and contusions and chest-squeezing compressions he'd experienced as his house collapsed onto him. But now, as the monster turned its moon-sized eyes down toward him, Max composed a poem in his head. He'd never written a poem of his own free will, nor did he enjoy poems all that much when he was required to read them in school. He liked movies and video games and drawing. He desperately wished he were better at drawing than he was. He'd had to take extra classes because of his handwriting difficulties. Drawing was supposed to help. There was a part of him that thought his inability to control the lines and loops he made on paper as being the truth of himself, and maybe even the truth outside himself. Within the poem were words his parents and teachers used in their complicated everyday lives prior to the monster attack. While Max couldn't define those words using a sentence of his own, he understood their usage and implications, in the same way he understood colors, humidity, shame, love, and ocean breezes. Max imagined, a large, imagined large swaths, swaths of emptiness between the lines of his poem to allow space for the giant monster to roam. He didn't have a title, though in a pinch he supposed the first line might work. This is the poem. Can a giant monster sharpen a pencil? How sharp? Number two, regular pencil or the joke kind? Either way, the answer depends on size, dexterity, fine motor skills, motivation. How many tries are allowed? And will there be electricity in the smashed up city to power an electric pencil sharpener? 
because I wouldn't expect anyone, especially a giant monster, to use those plastic square ones with a, sm with a small, not sharp, not sharp razor inside to shave away the wood and make a good drawing tip. And I hate when my teacher, Mr. Langan, uh, curse Mr. Langan, uh, expects me to use those stupid square ones. And Mom said there used to be a wall-mounted pencil sharpeners with a hand crank that worked pretty well before the electric ones. But I still think the answer depends on size, mostly size. With the last line completed, Max checked his empty pockets for his practice pencil to offer to the giant monster. It was one he used to draw and not practice letters. It was a regular yellow one. Nothing special, but he used it enough so that it had been whittled to the same length as one of his pinkies. He forgot he stuck it behind his slightly bowed out left ear, and when the end came, it was still there. And I dedicated it to my nieces and nephews. I'm sure they'll be thrilled. <laughs> uh,